Perfect. Yeah, I can uh, maybe try to gradually spin up here as as folks trickle in. Let me um, share my screen as a starting point. Let's see. No. Lost my mouth. Um, Chelsea, can you see this? Okay. Yep, looks great. Okay, perfect. Great. Well, um, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Chelsea, for inviting me uh, to present as part of um, this forum. Um, it's great to have an opportunity to talk about something that I'm very excited about, um, which is um, um, how to basically uh, help sort of draw on your audience and help communicate with them via effective, digital, di uh, effective data visualization. So a little bit of background about me. I am the Director of Undergraduate Studies for the Department of Computational Mathematics, Science and Engineering at Michigan State. Um, I've been with the department uh, for about four or five years now. Um, and, oh no, maybe it's six. Wow. Uh, and uh, I oversee the Bachelor of Science in Data Science program, um, as well as our um, minor in CMSE and our minor in Data Science. And a lot of what I do uh, for the department, not only do I oversee those programs, but I also teach a lot of computational modeling, uh, data analysis, and I actually regularly teach a 400 level data visualization course, which is where a lot of what I'm going to talk about today comes from. And I'll be bringing in uh, some ideas and concepts uh, from a couple of authors that are very sort of um, big and widely known in the data visualization world. And so that'll be kind of um, how I'll frame this. Um, and just to, 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 to give you a, a path of kind of where I'm headed, um, I have some ideas for things I want to share, ideas how maybe you can create more effective data visualizations, maybe some things you have thought about before, maybe some things that are new to all of you. Um, and then I probably won't fill up the whole hour. And then I do have a, um, a notebook available online that Chelsea will send out once we get to that point. Um, it is Python based. So for those of you that are tuning in um, and are familiar with Python, there might be an opportunity for you to actually play around with a little bit of code. Um, but for those of you that are not uh, Python familiar, maybe you bookmark it, bookmark it for the future when you are, or there's also some opportunities and some resources that you can just read through and maybe um, have some additional thinking. Um, and we'll, of course, have time for questions and discussion as well, uh, if everything goes as planned. So I'll go ahead and dive in, um, and hopefully that gave folks some opportunity to uh, to get logged in and get, get it set up here. So here we go. So uh, where I'd like to start this conversation in thinking about how we sort of um, connect with our audience through data visualization is I like to first say, um, let's break this down a little bit. And we'll go first with the, the idea of what is visualization, uh, not necessarily data visualization, but what is visualization broadly. Um, and I like this quote here. It comes from Al Alberto Cairo in The Truthful Art. Uh, a visualization is any kind of visual representation of information that is designed to enable communication, analysis, discovery, exploration, et cetera. And so really, I like the emphasis there that the goal of visuals are to communicate first and foremost, right? So if I have interesting results or findings, data, um, or generally uh, perhaps want to convey a, a theory or a model, often one of the great ways to do that is to create some sort of visual that my audience can connect with to develop their own understanding of the thing that I'm presenting, talking about, et cetera. Um, so I really like this framing. If we think about some examples that we may be used to um, as far as thinking about visualizations, some of the most common things are going to be standard charts that many of us have seen in textbooks, perhaps have made, things that maybe Excel can put together, or um, those of you that are familiar with R or Python, um, a lot of the things that we would often think as plots, basic charts, ways of getting data into a visual format to look for trends, um, uh, properties, evolution, uh, large-scale effects, whatever it is. Um, and there's all sorts of different um, types of charts that we can create. Um, and there may be ones uh, that you're unfamiliar with, uh, ones that uh, you use really regularly. Um, and often there are versions of, of charts that I will discover sometimes and go, oh, that would be a much better way to convey the thing that I was trying to get to than the thing that I was used to. And so it's always worth kind of keeping your eye out for, are there better ways to do the visualization I'm thinking about when it comes to maybe what my default instincts are when I go to make some data visualization? Of course, there's also a lot of ways to um, turn data into maps, right? A lot of uh, folks have kind of a uh, natural intuition often for how to interpret a map. And so if we can get our data to be embedded within that context, that can be a really good way to help communicate our results or, or our findings um, because folks kind of already have a basis. They use ideally are using maps regularly to navigate the world and sort of have some lived experiences around how to interpret a map and how it's useful. So if we can embed data in that context, that can also be really beneficial. 
Um, then, of course, uh, what we also often see on the internet, social media, websites, et cetera, uh, what we refer to as infographics. Um, and infographics are not what I would consider necessarily data visualization. It's often the visualization of key statistics, um, very uh, summarized information. Uh, there may be things embedded in it that would sort of count as uh, data visualization. For example, uh, in the, the middle there, it says 40% of people um, uh, respond better to visual information than text. Uh, and that little pyramid visual actually is four out of 10 people being darkened, indicating um, actual data sort of embedded in that statistics. But the one above it, 43% more effective in persuading audience members, the graphic next to that actually has nothing to do with the data, right? And so often we don't think as infographics as necessarily being the data represented in visual form. It's more of an eye-catching way to uh, share basic statistics and summaries of some sort of analysis. Can be really effective and really powerful, but might not be classified as true data visualization because of the data itself has been distilled into those key um, statistics. So that's kind of setting the stage. What do we mean when we talk about visualization? And then I'd like to go, okay, but if I'm saying there's some difference between maybe an infographic and a data visualization, what do I mean by data visualization? Um, and so I like, again, coming back to Alberto Cairo, he says, okay, if we talk about data visualization, then data visualization is the display of data designed to enable um, analysis, exploration, and discovery. So there's still some of the same goals, but he's really putting the emphasis that what I'm looking at is actual data. And so I'd like to highlight that the intent is to display the data, but do so in order to enable analysis, exploration, and discovery. Um, and so he really thinks about the idea that when I'm creating a data visualization, what I'm trying to do is create an opportunity for the audience themselves to interact with and extract meaning from my data. Okay, so I'm going to create visualizations that I think are the useful ones for them to look at. But I'm also going to try to design it in such a way that they can sort of draw their own conclusions, explore the data, and, and, and make their own discoveries as well. Okay. So that's kind of what I want to think about is displaying data, making sure the data is actually embedded in that visualization, but while doing so, enabling this analysis, exploration, and discovery piece. Okay. So how do we make effective data visualizations? If that's our goal is to display data so that folks can interact with it and extract meaning from it, how do we do that effectively? And I'm going to pull from a couple of authors. I'm going to pull again from Alberto Cairo, but I'm also going to pull from Edward Tufty, who um, if you Google, you know, who's who in data visualization, Edward Tufty's name comes up. He's got a very, um, very popular book that has been around for a very long time. He has a very, very, uh, uh, emphatic opinions about what good data visualization is. I don't necessarily agree with all of them, but I find that the principles that he presents give a nice framework to at least start thinking about what good data viz might look like. So I'm going to bring up some of those examples as well. So um, what are the main principles that Edward Tufte defines for graphical excellence, which is sounds like sort of a very um, grandiose term, but basically good data viz, right? Um, and so I'll kind of walk through some of these. Uh, it should be what a well-designed presentation of interesting data. Again, that's uh, the point we made earlier. It should be a display of data. Um, and ideally, you're showing something that has substance um, and involves some sort of statistics, thoughtful design. If what you're presenting in a data visualization could also be just summarized in a small table, then you shouldn't turn it into uh, a data visualization. You should just present the table, right? Because the table provides information. So don't go to the point of making data visualization unless you really have some substance to try to present, okay? Um, it should consist of a complex idea communicated with clarity, precision, and efficiency. So I shouldn't have to work hard at extracting meaning from your data visualization. If, if it requires a lot of finesse to figure out what it is your data visualization is even telling me, I may give up, I may check out, and I may miss the point, okay? Um, try to provide the greatest amount of information in the shortest amount of time. And, and this is something that Edward Tufty really harps on about with the least amount of ink. And I'll show you an example of what he means by that. Um, but try to make each individual data visualization as impactful as possible, right? If you find yourself that the only way to, to, to help your audience understand the point is through 30 different data visualizations, um, maybe you're not making each one count as much as it could. Um, and so try to figure out how do I maximize the information um, without getting uh, overly complicated, right? The clarity, precision, and efficiency is still important. So it's sort of a balancing act between having a great impact without being overly cluttered, confusing, misleading, et cetera. Um, 
Uh, often, really good data viz is multivariate. Multivariate again. This comes back to the idea of if I can summarize it with a table and a few simple statistics, uh, statistical metrics, then maybe I shouldn't be visualizing it, right? If I just have, uh, say, a bar plot with one bar on it, well, that's probably not that interesting or useful. And so I sh I'm ideally looking at multiple variables at the same time and using the data visualization as a way for me to compare, contrast, look for correlation, etc. Um, and then uh, the other thing he emphasizes, and this will come up when we look at Alberto Cairo's suggestions as well, is I should tell truth about the data. Okay, and so um, Tafsi talks about this as upholding graphical integrity, and we'll talk. We'll look at what how he defines that. But ultimately, data viz should not confuse, obfuscate, mislead. It should not deceive the viewer. It should be truthful. It should have integrity and allow the viewer to extract information from it. And I'm sure that many of you can think about opportunity or uh, experiences in working with data or seeing data visualizations presented where, where uh, perhaps in the media or other sources, you wonder, was that is that really the most honest way of presenting that data? Or are you sort of trying to hide something from me or, or skew the results in a way that lead me to believe something that is not wholly true about your data? Okay. Um, so then uh, in, in comparison and contrast to Edward Tufte's, where does Alberto Cairo fall in, in all of this? So he defines what he calls the five qualities of great visualizations. Um, again, uh, as you'll see the similarity, truthful, based on thorough and honest research. So it's your best ability to present the work that you've done in a way that is truthful and honest with the audience, okay? Um, it should be functional. It accurately depicts the data, allowing people, again, to perform meaningful operations to actually interpret, extract, and learn from your visualization. Um, ideally, it's 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 aesthetically pleasing. So, so one of his, his um, qualities is beautiful. It should be something you want to look at. If it's got really glaring colors or um, uh, glyphs or figures that make it really hard to interpret and it's, it's harsh on the eyes, I'm perhaps less likely to engage with it, right? So, so there is an importance of, is this aesthetically easy to look at? And, and, and can I, do I want to try, sort of try to extract more from this visualization? Or am I going, Ugh, I can't look at that anymore. Moving on, right? Um, it should be insightful. So you want it to actually uh, elicit evidence that we wouldn't see without it. Again, if, if a cursory glance at the data allows me to make the same conclusion as your piece of data visualization, then why did you create it, right? So it should actually um, elicit evidence, create meaning, um, showcase information that would otherwise be very difficult for the user to do, to see without spending a lot of time with your data, right? You are the person analyzing your data, make it easy for them to glean that information. Um, and then finally, uh, his last one is it should be enlightening, right? Um, he is of the opinion that we should not create data, data viz without purpose. Um, it should be something that we create in order to convey information and perhaps change someone's mind about something. And I think whether that's in the academic context of we're trying to convince people that the research we're doing really has value and that we have found new interesting discoveries, or perhaps uh, we're using it in a persuasive way, which you'll often see um, in many forms of media and things like that is uh, uh, data visualization created to uh, persuade, to convince, et cetera, okay? Um, and, and you can think about various sort of global efforts that that perhaps are enhanced by data visualization, trying to convince people, for example, that climate change is a thing we should be concerned about. There's lots of, of really good data viz out there that's trying to do that now with varying levels of, of success, I would argue, but here we are. So, um, and again, I just want to emphasize that, that Alberto Cairo also brings up this idea of, of being truthful in your data visualizations. So how do we make truthful data visualizations. If truthful data viz is important, how do we actually do that? So I'm gonna to come to Edward Tufte's principles of graphical integrity. So um, Tufte liked to create a lot of principles, had a lot of opinions, as I said earlier. Um, and so one of that set of principles is how to create truthful um, uh, uh, data, data viz with integrity. So I'll walk through those, okay? One of the important things when thinking about the representation of your data and, and specifically of numbers should be directly proportional to numerical quantities in your figures. What does that mean? Well, if I am creating a figure where um, I'm trying to, to display individual values, um, it, it is often better to look at relationships that are linear in nature than to create a volume that is somehow scaled based on your numbers in a way that's not transparent to the audience, right? So it should be a direct one-to-one -one proportionality, ideally. So if one of my quantities is twice as big as my other quantity, then the visual representation should be twice as big. It shouldn't be four times as big. It shouldn't be 10 times as big. That would be misleading, 
that would be um, untruthful, right? That would be me trying to convince you of something by um, grossly exaggerating uh, some of these relationships. So ideally, it should be directly proportional. Um, when there are cases when uh, due to the nature of the visualization or the tools you have available, um, the data visualization may be unclear. Labeling can be used to add clarity or to defeat some sort of graphical distortion. And so if by the nature of your graphics, you feel that it's not obvious how um, certain relationships are, are, um, are displayed or uh, how they're interconnected or which uh, values are which, uh, it can be useful to use labeling. You don't want to over label. You don't want to have everything annotated. Um, that would lead to uh, what I believe Tuffy would call chart junk or chart junk. Um, but labeling can be used to add clarity to your visualizations um, and make sure again that the truthful um, information is conveyed. Uh, make sure that you're showing variation in the data and not just creating design variation. So don't make an overly um, sort of uh, uh, fancied up um, plot with a lot going on unless that's actually conveying variation in your data, right? I don't need my eyes to be interpreting variation in the plot that doesn't have a meaning as it relates to the data itself, okay? Um, often, so this is one, using standardized units can be better than nominal units. And so one example might be if I'm trying to compare, say, gross domestic product between two countries, um, the size of the country is a big part of how, uh, what, how sort of big their economy is, right? And so if I were to compare the United States to a very small country, um, it might look like the um, uh, United States gross domestic product is massive compared to, say, Bangladesh. Um, sort of picked at random, uh, just had taught, taught some uh, analysis in my class. Those were two of the countries we were looking at. Um, and the United States is orders of magnitude larger because it has a much larger economy. And so what I should be doing is normalizing that in some way um, so that I can compare apples to apples. So creating opportunities to make sure that when I'm looking um, and trying to draw comparisons. Have I standardized the units in some way that allow me to actually meaningfully make those comparisons is important as well. Um, make sure that the information carrying dimensions of your visualization do not exceed the number of dimensions of data. So if I'm looking at one variable versus another variable, I don't need to add color to the mix as well, unless color is showing some third variable or some third dimension, okay? So I only add dimensions as they convey information, not just because it feels fun to include color or shapes or whatever. It should be driven by what's actually in the data. New dimension should involve um, uh, new variables, okay? Um, and then ultimately, don't quote the data out of context. So don't cherry pick your data. Um, hopefully this is obvious. Um, make sure that if um, you're choosing a, a particular range of your data that you're not doing so, so as to exclude some trend. So maybe I stop the curve right before it turns over if it's some sort of growing curve and all I care about is I want people to think this is going up. Uh, if it does turn over, I should make sure it's clear, right? So if there are features in the data that influence how one may interpret it and could lead to a false interpretation of that analysis, then I should be truthful and I should present it in its entirety. Now, I can make the argument um, after the fact why maybe that behavior is not as important as, um, say, it is this case of rising data with some turnover. Um, I can communicate that, but I shouldn't hide it from the viewer. Okay, so not quoting data out of context is also important for holding up, um, uh, creating uh, plots of integrity. Okay, uh, Alberto Caro, of course, has some um, uh, recommendations for creating truth for visualizations. Also, um, he says avoid self-deception. I think this is really important. I think sometimes when we um, go to analyze our results to work with our data, we had some theory in mind, some hypothesis, and we're going to be inclined to look for that, okay? Whether that's data that we took or data that we were handed from someone else, we have to be careful to avoid our own personal bias of what we think the data will tell us. Um, and try to say, okay, I'm just going to visualize the data and let the data tell me the trends that are there. If I go in with a particular agenda and want to see a particular result, I may trick myself into finding it, even if it's not really there, or in fact, perhaps the signal is not as significant or, or what have you. But avoiding that self-deception piece saying, okay, what, are, what, what am I being told when I analyze the data? What is the data telling me? Not do I, what, what do I want it to say, or what do I, what um, am I trying to convince the audience of that's not there? Okay, so being really thoughtful and aware of that is important. Um, and then be honest with your audience. Um, make sure that your audience understands where the data came from, uh, how it was processed, what assumptions go into it, and try to make sure you're delivering the best attainable version of the truth. Okay, based on your understanding of the data, 
and any bias that may have been baked into the data. Make sure you're uh, upfront about that. Allow the audience to draw their own conclusions based on the data visualizations you present. And of course, you're probably going to persuade and guide them towards their, your understanding, but they should be able to do so on their own without basically being tricked into it, okay? Um, so other things to think about as we think about data visualization um, in guiding the creation, or sorry, and, and what we can do to guide our data visualization creation, some other things that don't necessarily fit into the things that we already talked about um, are, uh, and I, I tell this to my students all the time, make sure you give yourself enough time to explore the data. Uh, don't go in it with, okay, I know I want to make this plot and that's the only thing I care about. Um, exploratory data analysis is super important. There may be um, features in the data you were not expecting, were not prepared for. Um, there may be nuance in the data that really you just need to spend some time visualizing. So um, I think Alberto Cairo talks about the idea of like, rarely does he go into it and just make one or two visualizations. Often he'll make a bunch of different visualizations, some of which may not prove to, to lead to anything interesting or meaningful. Um, but unless he does that exploratory data analysis step, you might miss things. So really spend your, like allow yourself the time and, and, and um, ability to really explore your data and extract as much as possible. Um, think about the story you're trying to tell. So as you design your data visualizations, what's the narrative? What are you trying to convey to your audience? Where are you hoping they're gonna end up by the time they get to the end of your story? And I think this is one of the, the things that I find the most important. Even when I'm writing a research paper, sometimes the first thing I do is say, what are the big, key figures that would take a person from understanding the beginning of what I want them to know and carry them through all the way to the end. And sometimes I'll build my data visualization and all my figures first, and then write the narrative that accompanies those, right? So what is the story that threads those all together and leads me to the big aha moment at the end? Um, and I find that by thinking about it as what is the story I'm trying to tell rather than what are, what are the scientific results I'm trying to present, which is maybe a, a, a nuanced take. Um, if I can tell it as a story, then I think the visualizations will be better aligned with that story um, and, and help guide them. Um, the other thing to think about is making sure how human perception might influence your choices. So um, depending on the use of color and whether or not that color is well seen by those that may be colorblind, that can be something to, to, to think about. Or say someone were to print this out in grayscale, what would the impact be? Um, so that can be one example. Other things to be aware of is that um, our, our mind's ability to interpret um, angles is not as good as our ability to interpret and, and parse lengths. And so, for example, one of the things we talk about a lot when I teach data visualization is pie charts can be actually um, very uh, misleading because by eye, uh, determining the, the differences between angles can be really hard. Um, so um, if, you, if you have some nuance embedded in a pie chart and you want people to be able to see that nuance, pie chart's probably not your best option. You may want to think about a way of presenting that information on a linear scale instead. And that's just a bit of how our mind works. And there's some literature out there. Um, uh, about how how our mind interprets information can help guide our um, choices about data visualization. Um, and then ultimately, make sure you don't blindly use statistics you don't understand. Make sure that you understand any biases that may be in your data. Where did your data come from? Who collected it? How did they collect it? Um, and are there opportunities where perhaps what you're seeing in the data that your visualizations are telling you is that a real signal or is that a result of some set of assumptions or biases built in there? Um, and try not to blind, blindly use the statistics without understanding um, what that statistic tells you. Is it a statistics that is robust to outliers or not, for example? Um, uh, and so being aware of how you're using those is also important. Okay, and then, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this idea of the data to ink ratio. Ideally, when you create a data, data visualization, you shouldn't use more ink. And now in the case of, of Tufty, when he first sort of wrote this, this is when uh, graphics are either drawn by hand or printed out onto paper, which often is not happening anymore. So the idea of saving ink is not necessarily something we have to worry about in the same degree, but I think the principle can still be useful. Don't overly um, decorate your, your figures if all it does is obscure the information you're trying to make. You should be able to do it with the least amount of ink, even though we may not be printing them anymore. And also I'll show you one, show you a GIF that kind of walks through an example of this that hopefully makes this point. You'll see to start out a plot that is very busy, has a lot of colors, shapes, textures, 
all sorts of things that just don't represent the data. And then slowly they strip away all of these decorations and convey in the end the key information they want to convey using a significantly lower fraction of, of ink in this regard. So, so let's see if this works here. So I'll just let you watch this and I'll kind of talk about it as it goes through. So you're going to start with this really intense, ooh, what's happening here? Um, and they're going to strip away pieces. And so they're going to remove extraneous um, lines and colors. Uh, they're going to simplify the bars to, you know, they don't need to be shaded. They don't have to have borders, right? A solid bar is plenty sufficient. Um, they don't need to have shadows. They strip that away. You can even start to take it, what I would argue, maybe a little too far, and they start stripping away the lines and the axes uh, structures. And maybe we don't need to get this aggressive. Um, but ultimately, if what they're trying to convey is where does bacon fall in caloric content compared to those other items, that final snapshot at the end makes it very clear that um, the calories of a serving of bacon are significantly more than perhaps than a serving of pizza, um, but not as much as French fries, right? And so this is sort of a silly stripped down figure. Um, but by the time they get to the end of this, they're conveying very effectively the point they want to make, which is to highlight bacon and show it in comparison to other common high calorie foods. Okay, so maybe that gives you one example of what we mean when we say to strip away some of that chart junk to maximize the data to ink ratio. Okay, so um, I think that's the most of what I have. So I, I really wanted to set it as a stage to put those ideas out there, to make them available. As I said, I have a um, Python-based notebook that further unpacks and sort of um, um, shows you what some of these ideas might mean in practice. And there's also links embedded in it to some of the references that, that I talked about. Um, so that information is available as well. And I guess what I would like to do now is um, open things to some discussion. And I'm hoping that at this point, Chelsea can also, or perhaps we can do the Q&A first and then Chelsea can share the link. But that's what I have for now. Let me, uh-oh. My mouse is gone, so I don't know if I can click on stop share. Hang on. Okay, so that's what I've got. Um, and I think Chelsea's gonna help me manage the Q&A. Thanks for a great session. Uh, does anyone have any questions before uh, I drop the link in the chat? I have a link for you all that I can put in the Whova and in the Zoom. I know that we have some on the Q&A as well, so I can start off with there while people are typing. So one of them is saying, how many slides should someone make for their presentation and what is the time frame for a presentation? So like how long should you spend per slide? Yeah, no, great. So uh, that's a good question. Um, I tend to have some habits of how I build slides that makes a hard and fast rule of thumb in that regard a little bit tricky. Um, but the thing that I was told sort of a while back is, um, whether or not maybe you have some transitions. So I think in some of my slides, I built some of the bullet points out. But the rule of thumb that I've always heard is that per minute of presentation, roughly one slide of meaningful content. Okay, you might have the occasional throwaway slide um, that only takes a few seconds to cover. And some slides you may need to unpack and spend more time on average. Um, but I think for this talk, I think the whole thing took me of order 25 to 30 minutes, and I have 25 slides. Um, and so that that I normally try to, to use that as kind of a rule of thumb. Um, I do occasionally get uh, overly anxious when I when I step into a talk and they put the little slide numbers on their slides and this is one of 300 or something, right? I, I, may, I might panic in that regard. But roughly a slide per minute for me has been kind of the sweet spot for that. Yeah. I agree with you. Um, we don't want someone to spend forever on one slide, but it's a nice pace to have it like one slide per minute. So um, someone else was uh, saying, do you think animations disturb the audience's attention? So could it be very distracting to have like animations and GIFs? Yeah, great question. Um, I think this, this is motivated by, um, I think the answer can be motivated by some of the principles that I'm talking about is if the animations serve to enhance your ability, your audience's ability to extract information, go for it. If you're doing it because you can, don't. OK, uh, that would be sort of my rule of thumb. Um, if it adds something meaningful, that is, the audience is going to better understand your point by adding the animation, then great. Often I see animations that feel like they were added because the technology can create them, not because it enhanced the, the presentation or the visualization. Um, what I will say related to that 
is um, Alberto Cairo talks a lot about interactive visualizations. And if you have the ability to present and create opportunities for interactive visualization, um, which can be hard, uh, you know, journal articles don't often allow you to create things you can fiddle with and slide around with. Um, but uh, I've also seen interactive visualizations used effectively. And so that's a form of animation, but it's one that enables exploration, right? If things can, if I can drag and drop and wiggle sliders and maybe even do it during a talk, that can be really valuable. But it's again, it's in pursuit of maximizing the impact of my database. That should be the driving factor. If you're adding it because it just feels fun, that's probably not the right choice. Yeah. Thank you. And the other one is what are the key points to uh, or like ways to get the audience's attention and to keep their attention? Sure. Yeah. Well, I think to the point of keeping one's attention, that's where I think the important part about data visualization is making sure it's not overly complicated. If I, as an audience member, have to work really hard to extract information from your data viz, I'm probably going to start to check out, right? If you're just hitting me with a figure that has 12 different line styles, 30 different colors, sizes are changing, there's more than one axis I have to interpret, I'm going to get information overload, and that's more likely that I'm going to tune out. Um, and so I think uh, uh, how do you keep your audience is making sure that it's easy for them to grapple with the, the data visualizations you're presenting. How do you hook them to begin with? Um, that's an interesting question. I think good data viz can draw someone in. Um, and so uh, maybe, you know, thinking about, and I've seen this done to some success, is perhaps you have really that one really impactful figure that makes your key point maybe throw that up up front and, and say here's my really astounding like result now let me walk you through how i got there okay um might be a good way to hook someone and i've seen that done well um you don't necessarily want to give away the ending but sometimes i think giving away the ending can help someone want to find out how you got to that particular and this one is more specifically for demographic data. They're wondering what's a suitable method to visualize it. So maybe uh, what are some ways that would be easiest to display that? Yeah, so it depends a little bit on how your demographics data is ag aggregated. The way that I see demographics data a lot is in this sort of data map form that I talked about earlier on. Um, if the demographic, If the demographic information is coming from geographical, um, locations, then pairing it with a map, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, if, again, if your demographics are really more about, um, properties within populations and things like that, um, ultimately you, the choice of how you present demographics data, again, should say, well, how am I, what's the result I want to convey and how do I best convey that? So, so I don't know that there's one right sort of demographics visualization because ultimately the what the right choice is the one that again maximizes understanding with minimal audience effort and so um that's where some of these uh tools that exist out there there's a lot of graph galleries there's a python graph gallery there's an r graph gallery um there's a data viz library that exists um and those sometimes have really useful ways to say am i trying to am i trying to visualize a correlation in data well then here's a set of plot styles that are really good for that am i trying to show trends over time here's a set of plot styles that are really good for that um, and so again, which which you use should be driven by what are you trying to accomplish, I guess, is my cop out answer to that question. Yeah, so not exactly demographic data, but what about data in general when you have so many data points that it's just too much for like a bar graph and it'll be too clustered if it's a scatter plot, it'll look more like a line plot. But you, for example, have um we and guard do a lot of rapid diagnostics. So imagine you have a biological sample, each sample is different and you wanna show the results of things like that. Like how do you go upon when you have so much data? Yeah, no, good question. So I think that will that's where that comes into um, the importance of the early phase exploratory data analysis. So, so the first thing you've got to do is orient yourself yourself to the data, right? And if there's a lot of it, um, a lot, often what I'm gonna do is try to First, think about what are some questions I want to answer given the data set, right? Given what I know to be existing in the data, what information is there, if I can try to hone it down to some questions, then I might be able to first subset and filter the data and start figuring out, okay, 
if I limit myself to just looking at this set of values versus all these other ones, maybe there's an obvious way to visualize that. Um, when you're looking at like really complex and multivariate data, sometimes in the exploratory data analysis phase, it's okay to throw it all in one plot, okay? Um, and try to tease out those trends. What I often discourage is the idea of that's your exploratory plot. That's the one that allows you to extract information and meaning from data. That's not the one you put in the presentation, right? The one that throws it all into one gross plot with a million lines or 8,000 different colors, um, that can be really useful to make meaning from data um, because I think to understand our data, we first need to visualize it. But that should be like a first draft and then say, okay, now that I personally have seen all of these hideous plots that are hard to interpret, what's the right one to sort of pare it down to highlight the key answers that I wanna try to, to get out there? And something to keep in mind is that a presentation is also different than, for example, submitting a journal article, because if you print out a paper, it's not going to have any animations on it. So um, how do you maybe go upon sifting through and turning a presentation into a journal article? Yeah, so audience is important too, right? So for a presentation, I need to think, am I presenting to... Um, uh, expert, similar experts to me who are in the field, and, and maybe that's my audience. In that case, sometimes the uh, the articles I or the figures I put in a paper may be the ones I put in a talk that's all amongst experts because they're going to have the, the background and the knowledge to do it. Often when I'm presenting to a wider audience, I am creating a sort of perhaps simplified or stripped down uh, set of visualizations where maybe... Um, Maybe I know in a journal article, I can have a figure that takes a few minutes to digest to because someone's going to you know sit down with this article. They're going to give themselves ideally some time to actually understand it. Whereas in a presentation, I want to um, minimize the amount of time it takes to get information. So often my talk um, plots are much simpler than what I might put in a journal article because I know a journal article, that person has time to sit with it. And I want them to see the nuance and the complexity and the depth of data. And, and it should still be easy to extract information, but I might be able to put more in a journal article figure than I would in a plot. Whereas a plot, I'm trying to keep them hooked. I'm trying to keep them following that story, that narrative, and make sure that they're not having to overinvest time in understanding the figure. Otherwise, I might lose them entirely. Yeah, and like you were saying from one of the earlier questions, you want to have one minute per slide. So if you put a very complicated uh, figure on there, you're just going to spend forever talking about that one figure in that one slide. Yes, <laughs> if you if you ever find yourself saying, to putting a figure up in a talk and going, okay, now let me take a few minutes to walk you through this. That's probably not the right figure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because then they're just like, what's happening? Uh, right. so another question, um, I think this has a lot to do with accessibility. So um. I personally cannot read well from far. And they are asking about what's the best font size for your heading and then for the body text. Oh, yeah, that's a good, that that can be very hard to tell because what looks good on your screen when you're writing your talk versus how it will show up um, in a, a conference venue or even in a classroom um, can be very hard to predict. I normally err on the side of this looks too big <laughs> um, because I want to make sure that that folks can see it. There are some guides out there. And in fact, there are some tools. Um, uh, for example, there's a, a package in Python called Seaborn that actually has a uh, essentially a, a flip, a switch you can flip where you can say, this figure is going into a talk and it will, it will rescale and size everything. This is going into a paper, it'll size everything. This is going on a poster and it'll size everything. So one of the things I would recommend is, is for the tools that you may be using to generate your visualizations, see if someone out there has figured out what some of the right default parameters are for creating those visualizations based on the format, because those may exist. Um, but saying uh, what the one right font size is is really hard um, other than what I would say is err on the side of something that seems a little too big because you never know how far away the audience is going to be when giving your talk. And so um, sometimes it makes it hard to make a plot that fits if, you, if the text is too big. But if you ever find yourself shrinking the text to fit more on a slide, probably means you're putting too much on the slide. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, reading a slide to everyone is not like you might as well just get the paper. <laughs> so, sure, right, yeah. The questions in the Zoom chat, you might be able to see it, but they said, thanks very much for your insight, Devin. Do you have any advice for designing graphical abstracts? 
Oh, um, I don't have a ton of experience uh, doing graphical abstracts. Um, I believe when you're talking about graphical abstracts, you mean sort of like schematics that kind of summarize findings. Is that is that what you mean when you refer to graphical abstract? Uh, yeah, Hi, thank you so much. Gotcha. Oh, I was just saying yes. Um, for that. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, oof. Uh, yeah, I don't have, a, I, it's not something that I do much in my field. I haven't had a, a need to create those, but I have used them for proposals. And I think a lot of the same rules apply, right? Again, you want to minimize how much effort the audience has to has to exert to get to understanding, right? So you're trying to maximize content, minimize effort, because again, the longer it takes me to figure out what a figure is telling me, the more likely I am to tune out, right? So I think making sure it's not overly busy, making sure that your design choices are such that they feel hopefully intuitive, um, which it can take some time to intuit what the right choices are. But again, I think trying to figure out um, how long would it take someone who's never seen this before to understand my point, right? And trying to figure out how to make that as short as possible while still making the point is a good rule of thumb maybe to um, guide that design. Yeah, good question. Um, I should create more graphical abstracts as a test of my my skills. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I'm just going to kill a bit of time while waiting for more questions just before we put the link in, but I've created a few graphical abstracts and I would say that I'm going to use the biology example because it seems like a lot of us study biology over here. So think about like how you have your aims. You might want to break up your graphical abstract to just clearly but concisely describe that aim. So if you, for example, are saying something is upregulated, so it's having more of it, then you would put it in green or have like an up arrow. And then mm -hmm. it's very easy for people to see that. So like if you say like, something is making something produce more, you want to show that it's green, unless it's bad, then you can use colors in that aspect, but just make it super simple that you might just want like one, two, three, but that it'll tell people really quickly. So people say that a graphical abstract should be able to tell you a story that's worth like 300 to 500 words, because that's basically an abstract. Uh, so I know that was specific aims. So I just spoke enough. I don't see any questions on there. So I'm dropping this link in the chat that you told me about, and I'm going to put in the FUVA while you're explaining this. Perfect. Yeah. So so thank you, Chelsea, for sharing that. What that link is to, um, for those of you that 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 are probably already Python, that for anyone who's already Python familiar, um, it may look familiar to you. It may not, depending on how you choose to use Python. Uh, but Google offers this service called Collaboratory. And so... Um, uh, I think it should be publicly viewable, but if you end up wanting to make a copy of it, you will need to have a Google account, whether that's Gmail or, or through your own institution. Uh, but it's, it, what I provided there is what's called a collaboratory notebook. Um, it it basically is a special Googleized version of a Jupyter notebook, which is something that the Python community has developed. And these notebooks are a really nice way of integrating narrative text with functional code and data visualizations. And so I like to share it as a medium because it, it allows me to integrate a lot of the things that I teach into one place, right? So I can do everything I wanna do inside of a Jupyter Notebook. So if you're familiar with Python um, and you wanna tinker with that, it sort of um, hits on some of the various points that I talked about um, as it regards to data visualization. It has some example code. It also has some links to some, some references. Uh, it has some uh, tasks, sort of an attempt to try practicing some of the things that are included in that notebook and putting them into practice. Um, and so if you go to that link, it should be viewable only. So you can't actually run any of the code or edit it. But if you click on file and go save in drive, if you have a Google account, it'll save a copy of it and launch it ideally as a collaboratory notebook. It may ask you to enable Google Collaboratory for that to work, but it's basically a little um, playground. You can't break anything. It's hosted in the cloud, so it's not going to ruin anything on your own computer, and you can play around with that. And so if you're not familiar with Python, you may want to file it away for a day when you do have an opportunity to play around with Python, or you can also just spend some time reading through some of the points in there. So some of the, the ideas and concepts that I might cover in a longer course on data visualization are embedded in that notebook. Um, and for those that do have Python skills, you might just want to dabble and see um, if you can put into practice uh, some of these data visualization principles I talked about. Cool. I think that's it. If anyone has any other lingering questions or um, 
you want to copy my slides, um, I can either send them to Chelsea or you can reach out to me directly at my email address, which I think is embedded in that notebook. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's all I have. Devin, I would just like to thank you on behalf of Guard for your time and great presentation. We really appreciate it. Perfect. Yeah, very, very excited to be here. Chelsea, thanks for reaching out. I always love to talk about database. Thank you. Thanks always, Devin. Take care. Perfect. Bye. Bye.